The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. What kind of illumination do you have in your house? Incandescent bulbs, or you got those curly fluorescents, or have you got some of those cool new LEDs? There's really only one reason why you can see my face right now. Even though I'm inside a building, you can see me because of electric lights, incandescent lights. Some of them may be fluorescents, but most of them are incandescent. That probably is how your home is lit as well. Electric light bulbs are everywhere, thanks to Thomas Edison. And for well over a century now, America's homes are illuminated at night because of incandescent lights. But before that era was what's called the gaslight era. My old house that I live in, built in 1880, still has its gas pipes. And it, we still run our furnace and our water heater off of gas. But we also have a network of old steel pipes still built into our walls that used to deliver gas to burners and jets so that they could be used for illumination as well. Before that was the era of oil lamps. First whale oil and then kerosene took over. And in the years before and right after the Civil War, that's how people would light their homes at night. They would fill these reservoirs with oil, at first taken and harvested directly from the blubber of whales, and then kerosene got to be cheaper and they would use that. Before that, it was candles, and every colonial village had a candle maker because that was the most economical way to get illumination. I would like to talk to you this Advent season about choice number two, oil lamps, because that is the way in which God chose to illuminate his sanctuary among the Israelite people. And there's an Advent story in the story of the oil lamps. Well, you know the modern era, you know how we uh, light our homes now. Ever since Thomas Edison in the 1870s came up with this brilliant invention, uh, we now use incandescent lights or their, their new little cousin, the twisty uh, compact fluorescence. Before that, they used uh, candles. Got one right here to illustrate. Made out of animal tallow. These weren't used in Bible times. Uh, the King James Version of the Bible uses the word candle, but uh, they really were not used in the Mediterranean world. And today, candle shops are for women, uh, mainly exist for females who want their houses to smell better and want a little bit of romance. But in the middle part of the 1800s, uh, before, in the decades before and right after the Civil War, they had a different way of illuminating their homes, and that was with oil, which turned out uh, sort of back to the future in a way. Not olive oil. We didn't ever really burn olive oil in any quantities here in the United States. But we used whale oil. Uh, the whalers figured out that, you know, they had gigantic amounts of blubber inside a whale, and that spermaceti uh, tallow inside a whale made an excellent thing that you could burn. They, they used whales for many different things, but the, the fuel, they were gigantic sources of fuel. And it would uh, please me to give you a little demo right now, so I will. I don't happen to have, I was not able to discover any whale blubber on short notice. <laughs> but I do have some regular oil. And in our country, Illumination source number two, candles, oil, gas, and electric. This was number two, and this also was the main form of illumination in Bible times inside the house. This is the only way you could see what you were doing after nightfall. There we go. In the Mediterranean world, olive oil was cheap and easily locatable. In fact, right outside Jerusalem, uh, to the east, right across the Kidron Brook, was the Mount of what? Olives, you all know that, the Mount of Olives. In fact, there were so many olive trees, it made sense to have a permanent oil extraction facility located right there. And the Hebrew words for olive press are guth shemen. 
And so it came to be a little clearing and a place that Jesus liked to go on a retreat. It's like a little urban park. And you don't know it as Gethsemane. You know it as the garden of what? Gethsemane. It was right there. And they used olive oil for everything. It was like the wonder substance in the uh, Bible times. Uh, in a place where it was not easy to get uh, creams and lotions and stuff, every female who, who feels her hands dry out and is worried about her face getting all ashy and peeling, they would rub the oil into their hands to keep them lubed up. If you were outside working outside a lot in a very dry climate with a lot of sun beating down, you'd be glad to have a little oil to rub into your face, perhaps even lube up your hair a little. It, in the pre-brill cream days, and the pre-gel days, uh, it actually kind of helped to manage your hair if it was a little wild and woolly. They also used it for cooking, of course. They didn't have Crisco and Mazzola uh, back in those days or oleo. So to have some oil to cook with, you know, you need that when you bake to help everything kind of stick together. You need oil to cook with. And even today, uh, fine Italian restaurants all are very proud of their extra virgin olive oil that's used in their meals, in their entrees. And of course, also it's the, it's the binder for many salad dressings that you'll have in fine restaurants. But one of its most endearing uses back in the day was to burn. Olive oil is flammable. And it was the substance that God chose as part of his Advent drama. And we're in Act 2 of the Advent drama of the tabernacle. And I'd like to invite you to open up your Bible to Exodus chapter 25. And we're going to take a look at what's inside the tent. Still doing, you're doing well. Last week I talked to you about the basic courtyard, the fence, which set off the sacred space. God told Moses from on Mount Sinai, he said, have them make a sanctuary for me. San sanctuary is based on the Latin word sanctus, means a holy place. I want a place among you that will be respected, but yet which will bring comfort to people that I haven't given up on you, so that they know I'm there with you, but yet close enough that we can have some interaction, an interface, that they can worship me, confess before me, and I can express my love and forgiveness to them. Make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. So they screened off sacred ground. Four of them would fit on a football field. The long side of this rectangle would be roughly sideline to sideline, if you imagine it along the goal line of a football field. And then imagine the other side on about the 25-yard line. That was the general size of the courtyard. Inside that courtyard, oh, we talked about this last week, I won't go into it again, was the fire pit. Basically a bronze grate on struts, getting it about four or five feet in the air. And that is where two things went on. Animals were cut up in a bloody way, their blood caught and butchered, sprinkled on the altar, poured out uh, around the edges of it for the shedding of blood for human sin. And certain choice portions of that animal were burned, the other parts were eaten by the priests and in certain of the sacrifices in a communal meal with the worshiper. It was a, a re-knitting together of a, a torn and frazzled relationship. The second main thing that was done there was where people would burn up an animal entirely to symbolize total dedication to the Lord. But that's as far as you'd be allowed to go. You were allowed to go in the courtyard and they probably had to take turns. The nation, as I, I've told you before, probably numbered two to three million people. This is like the city of Chicago sprawled out in the southern part of the Sinai wilderness. A quarter of a football field would be lost in the middle of that mass of humanity. Most days you couldn't even see it you'd just be too far away. You had to take your turn, but when you were allowed to go in, and your, your tribe will tell you when it was your turn, you would visualize and participate in that bloody sacrifice, and all would be well, for the forgiveness of God would be pronounced on you because of the slaughter of an innocent victim. Now, the priests were allowed to go inside. There was a tent there made of a, a structure of 48 um, acacia wood beams, light enough that you could carry them. They weren't gigantic like Wisconsin farmhouse trusses. You'd never be able to stagger down the road with them. 
So they were as lightweight as possible, made like tinker toys with interlocking sockets that could be hooked together and you could assemble this framework like the frame of a house and then over the top of it, you would throw the tent fabric. It was to be made in a rectangle, 45 feet by 15. Think of it like three large living rooms in a row. Only one of them was a double wide. There was no interior wall between two of them. So you had a larger room filling up two-thirds of it and a little cube at the end, the second room. Over the top of it went fine linen. Over the whole top, the craftspeople, the men and women, spun flax into linen, wove it. They, they had set up, you know, remember I told you last week, they had set up a tent city there. This was not just camp. They were there for probably over a year. And that meant that they had time to set up looms and a foundry to make all kinds of metal stuff and were able to weave. And they wove and stitched together a gigantic linen tent, threw it over the top and staked it down. Over that went the wool layer made out of mostly goat hair, a little bit of uh, ram's, uh, ram's hair, dyed red. The middle layer was red. Perhaps God wanted them think in blood. And over the top of that, uh, they were able somehow to get a hold of hides of sea mammals, like manatees. There must have been manatees in the Mediterranean back then. And they were skinned. That they either bought or, or caught or trapped these and skinned them and knit them together and then threw a gigantic leather thing over the top of that and staked it down. So God really wanted that innermost room to be pretty dark. He had three layers over the top of it. Only the priests were allowed to go in, and then only the first bigger room. The little one at the back, only one human being could enter once a year. That, of course, would be the high priest on the Good Friday of the Old Testament, the great day of atonement. Now, if, if you were... Aaron or one of his descendants. And if you uh, peeked behind the flap and actually went in to a place reserved only for priests, and by the way, you better have made your sacrifices and you better be ceremonially clean, including washing up on the washstand. God was so serious, he said to the priests, you better wash or you will die. Wash or you die. Nobody stands before me dirty. My holiness will slay you. So they... <laughs> Got their attention. It would get mine. It sure got theirs. If you'd step in, you'd see a number of things. On your left, you would see a lampstand. Not a little one like this, but a seven cupper made with branches like this. Probably had a wooden frame of acacia wood, but then overlaid and hammered with gold in beautiful detail. Where do you say, where did they get gold? They melted down their jewelry. They melted down things that they had taken from Egypt. The, the bronze that they needed for the altar came from the mirrors of the women that they donated to have melted down, which I think is pretty cool. You know, they didn't have glass mirrors back then, but every female uh, of all times knows that she's relentlessly being judged on her appearance. So women back then had mirrors too. They were made out of polished metal. The women gave up their mirrors and went around with messy hair so that God could have his altar. Inside was the candlestick. And the Bible uh, in the King James calls it a candlestick. It wasn't a candlestick because there weren't candles. It was a lamp stand of seven branches. Uh, today, the Jews use that as one of the symbols of the nation of Israel and of Judaism. It's called the menorah in Hebrew. In English, it comes out to menorah. Although sometimes you'll see them with nine branches. Those are called the Hanukkah menorahs. They're used for a different purpose, not to recall the temple and the tabernacle, which had seven, but to recall the liberation of the temple from the Syrian invaders at the time of the Maccabees. Another story for another day. And it was the job of the priest every evening to go there and set up to fill all the oil cups so that those lamps could burn all night, get the wicks just right, keep, make sure that they were all tended and all burning because the light that would be lit from that lampstand was to symbolize the presence and happy face of God. Nobody puts out candles when you're angry. There's different kinds of fires for judgment and anger. Candles are when you're relaxed and there's fellowship and togetherness. Uh, there's, guys, if your wife makes dinner, 
or your girlfriend makes dinner and there's candles on it, there's a message there, this little heads up, uh, that she's not just interested in pounding down some chow, but wants, is interested in some conversation and a relationship. When God lights the lamps, he's smiling at you, saying, welcome to my home. You've passed through the blood. You're good with me now. I'm smiling. I'm, I'm relaxed. It's my house. Welcome to my house. Welcome to my sanctuary. Now, as you know, they couldn't go in, though. So God said, make a representation. Now, this might be one of the oddest representations of people you ever did see. Um, this is a little high on the top. Theirs would have been flatter. He said, make me some bread. Uh, make me a table. You can see the instructions for both of those things in Exodus 25. I'm not going to read it all for you as I normally would with a text. You can read this yourself. But in Exodus 25, starting at about verse 23, are the detailed instructions for a golden lampstand and a golden table. About the size of your coffee table, except a little taller, and it had a big rim around it, as big as my, as tall as my hand, probably to keep stuff from sliding off. He said, make loaves. And they were probably about that size. I don't know, do any of you make bread from scratch? They said, he, God said, use four quarts of flour. Now, that's a fairly good sized loaf, isn't it? I'd say that's probably, what do you think? Is this about a four quarter? I, I think so. I, I'd say. It's risen a little bit, of course. Only they were flat. I, it says put them in a row, but I, honestly, I don't know if a coffee table size is big enough for 12 four-quart loaves. I, I kind of think it, uh, some pictures show them stacked. I, for me personally, that seems more believable, that they were stacked, six and six. Each loaf represented a tribe, representing people. The bread was the people. They gave it as an offering to God. And then in the middle of that table was a golden pitcher. When you were making an offering from your produce, your farm, the squeezings from your first grapes or the pressings from your first olive harvest, you would bring a jug of it. It would be put in that pitcher and a ceremonial libation would be poured out right in front of that golden table. God knows you can't, it seemed like a waste but he said, give it to me anyway. It's called a sacrifice. In this way, you are showing your confidence that I gave it to you in the first place and you're showing your confidence that I can replace it ten times over. That if I turn off the spigot in your life, you won't have anything. When I open it up, you will have an abundance. So pour it out. There also were spoons and little bowls for sprinkling a little bit of fragrant frankincense on that table. Here is the concept. A candle, actually I keep saying candle, an oil lamp and bread. This is what the priest would see. All night long, those lamps burned, showing God smiling. All night long, the bread was a symbol representing the people. This was an Advent drama so that people would know how can there be a happy relationship between me and God. You need to know that too. You need to know how you and God can relate, which is more important than how are you going to find a better job than you have now. How are you going to upgrade your current girlfriend to more trophy status? Or how can you find a better guy who will take better care of you? This is more important than how are you going to get out of that apartment and finally get your own house. God, how can you and I have a relationship where you're smiling and I'm not in fear. That is the most important issue in your life and the Advent drama answers it. Know this, now as then, you have no business walking into God's house like you own it or deserve to be there. The tabernacle basically was like a big old hand saying, stop right there, no farther. You are sinful and I am holy. You and I need to remember that message. God owes you nothing. You and I come into his presence like beggars on our knees. Nothing in my hands I bring. All I got is my sin and my need. Be on your knees. It's a good posture. The second message is through the shedding of the blood of a sacrifice, you may approach into God's house through blood. It is Jesus Christ's blood 
who made the killing of animals unnecessary once and for all. When the Lamb of God on Calvary died, your debts were paid in full, and God smiles at you now. And through the light of faith that the Spirit has kindled in your heart, you are connected to your forgiveness. Only through Christ do you have that. Through no other means, not your own efforts, not any other mediator, but Christ alone. And he not only is the victim, but the priest who offers it as well. He's the guide and the interface that makes it possible for you to connect with God. The third and final takeaway from this Advent drama is for you to realize that most of the people, you included if you had been there, never saw this stuff. It was hidden from your eyes. Unless you were Aaron and his sons, you never saw the lampstand. Maybe you got a peek at it if, you were, if your tent was near there when it was time to pack up. But they had coverings that shrouded the holy vessels. And all you may have seen is priests and Levites carrying bulky stuff with long golden poles sticking out. You may never have seen the bread or seen the oil lamps. You accepted it by faith. For he reveals his deity and veils it in secret. You accepted the message of things that you could not see. Your life right now may seem very frustrating to you because you want to see God's face. You'd like to see more miracles in your life. And maybe some of you have incredible stories of God directly invading your life and doing things no one else could. But maybe not. Maybe you're trudging along like these Israelites in their dust. I encourage you to use this Advent time Profit, uh, profitably and confidently so that you not panic or think that all is lost because my life is such a struggle. We're, we're hiking in the desert right now. And uh, the prophet Isaiah says, God, surely you are a God who hides himself. That's not a sign of weakness or disaster or failure. It's part of the design for God to lead us on by faith. If you wait until you lay eyes on Christ before you make up your mind what to do with him, it will be too late. Now is the time. Here is your chance, maybe your one chance. Don't muff it. Don't blow it. Now is your time. It's like you're a punt receiver playing in the Super Bowl. You don't get lots of tries. When 300 million sets of eyes are watching you and that punt's coming down, that's your chance. Do not muff it. Today is your chance to realize what God was trying to teach the Israelites, that what you cannot see is conveyed to you in a message and it makes all the difference in the world. But as you, as you see yourself up here in this loaf of bread, realize that the flames of that lampstand are the smiles of God beaming down upon you for through Christ, it's all good between you and him. And you may live your life now, no matter what messes are going on, no matter what sins you have forgiven, no matter what fears and insecurities and depression you may struggle with, you may live your life joyfully and confidently, knowing that God and you are all good. This is good news for God's people. Let everybody say amen. As you are preparing your home for the Christmas season, I'm pretty sure that you've got special lighting inside, don't you? Perhaps you've strung some extra strands of light around your archways, or maybe you've got some trees. I, I actually know some people that have a half a dozen different trees of various sizes. Not just their big one in the living room, but they love the lights. Perhaps you've strung some outside your home as well in this dark time of year to shed some more light into your home. You know, we kind of use Christmas trees and evergreens to symbolize the never-changing, always green love and forgiveness that God has for us. Those trees do not die over the winter. They don't shed their leaves. The lights that we string in our houses also have some beautiful Advent symbolism that just as the people of Israel knew that inside the holy place, the light 
coming from those oil lamps from the lampstand would never go out and signify the smiling, happy face of God upon them, represented by the bread. You and I can know with absolute certainty that as we light extra lights in our house in the Advent season, let those lights represent the smiling face of God for you, that his presence is always with us and that it's a happy presence, that because we've passed through the fire of the sacrifice, the altar of sacrifice, we may now enjoy the smiling and approving face of God. Don't go away. I'll be back to pray with you in just a minute. Would you like a resource to help you in your personal planning and renewal in the new year? Then we'd love to send you a Grace Moments Devotions book for January through March. These daily readings will provide you with a little scripture and life application to encourage and sustain your faith each day. This book is available for your best gift. Call today or visit timeofgrace.org slash store to request your copy. If you've ever done anything on Facebook, you know that one of the things you can do is click the little image or icon that says like, and you can like something. And this shows support to the type of content that you are enjoying, whatever it might be. You know, your gifts to Time of Grace are a really sincere way of saying that you like the program and its content. I want to thank all of you who in this past year have provided financial support for Time of Grace. And if you have not made a gift this year, let me ask you today, right now, to pray and consider a gift to this vital ministry to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and make him look good to the world. We have no other way of support other than you, our friends, our viewers, and our readers. So please like Time of Grace today with one of your gifts. I'd like to pray with you today. This Advent season, let's ask for Jesus to be light in our hearts. Lord Jesus, long ago when you designed your earthly house a sanctuary to live among the people of Israel. When they had been forgiven through the slaughter of a sacrificial victim, they, through their priests, could enter into your presence and experience the light of your presence and the light of your smile. We ask this Advent season that we remember it is only through you, the light of the world, that we can enjoy the favor and smile of our God. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Chesky, reminding you every day is a day of God's amazing grace for you. Helping you reach the next level of your Christian life is a driving passion for Mark Jeske and the ministry team at Time of Grace. When you visit timeofgrace.org, you'll find more resources than ever, including video extras, social media connections, new products, plus our prayer ministry, all at timeofgrace.org and pray about becoming a Grace Partner, an exclusive group of partners and donors who are committed to help us expand Mark Jeske's teaching ministry around the world. Just call 1-800-661-3311 or visit us at timeofgrace.org. Thanks for watching, and join us again next time for Mark Jeske and Time of Grace. The preceding program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.